Hey guys, so I normally draw this stuff about metabolism and um, the, the Krebs cycle or cellular respiration for you on the board so you have a big color-coded board of um, explanation for this, but we don't have a dry erase board right now and we're not meeting in person, so this was the best I can do. Uh, please forgive shaky camera. I am going to be kind of pointing out my drawing to you guys while explaining. Um, and recording myself going through this. But yeah, here we go. So when we talk about your metabolism, we talk about how fast your body at a resting basal level is breaking down energy, breaking down food and nutrients into the energy that you need. So this means your base metabolism or your basal metabol metabolic level is how quickly your body is breaking down energy when you are going comatose in front of Netflix or when you're asleep, that kind of thing, right? Everybody's metabolism is going to be a little bit different. Faster people break down food into energy faster and burn it off more quickly. People with slower metabolisms do that slower. All of that kind of stuff we've gone over in your endocrine system and is greatly affected and controlled by your hormones and your thyroid. Um, but other things affect it as well, and it's going to be different for everybody's basic body chemistry. Um, that being said, these are the basics of how that kind of stuff works. So to live and survive, everybody needs water, and your chemical formula for water is H2O. You need food, which normally breaks down into simple sugars, which is sugar. That's your chemical formula for sugar right there, C6H12O6. And you need to breathe. You need oxygen. So there's your oxygen right now, the O2. Our bodies break that down, and that's what that arrow means. A chemical reaction is happening, and this is what went into the chemical reaction. This side of the arrow is what came out of it. We breathe out carbon dioxide. That's our body's breathe out waste, right? Uh, we get energy from all of this, so our bodies create energy, and a little bit of water is also a byproduct. Fun biology interesting fact, if you flip this arrow in reverse so it's pointing that way, you have the chemical formula for photosynthesis, which is what trees do to make energy. This is why us and plants get along very well and why we need to balance each other in nature. Because trees take in water, sunlight for energy, and they breathe in the carbon dioxide that we breathe out, and the trees make as their waste products oxygen, sugar and food, and a little bit of water. So us and plants need to work together, right? That's basic bio. Uh, cellular respiration is this formula, though, going in this direction, and it's what our bodies do. There are, oh, there are three stages of cellular respiration. Glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, which can also be called your citric acid, ci citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain, or ETC. And at the end of the electron transport chain, that causes a chemical reaction called oxidative phosphorylation. Right? All of this happens in different parts of your cells. If you guys remember really fast to your fifth grade science teachers or maybe your kids at home coronavirus homework, um, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It looks like a little squiggly jelly bean. This is where all of that is taking place. Cytoplasm is the jelly that's out and like, you know, just floating around where all these organelles are floating inside your cell. And the mitochondria has a matrix on the inside of it. And then the parts that make up the squiggly lines or the outer membranes are called the cristae. Right? Another little tip for us knowing how to do this is the energy that our body make is called ATP. That's a chemical called adenotriphosphate because there are three phosphates to it. Our bodies have figured out this chemical version of a battery um, and it can be used and recharged. When we use that ATP energy, um, a phosphorus basically breaks off of this compound 
and it can be recharged. The remaining compound is called ADP, which is called adenodiphosphate, because there's only two phosphates or phosphoruses on that formula. Once you have recharged it, it means you, our bodies have stuck an extra phosphorus onto it to make more ATP. That'll go to our muscles, be used as energy. ATP goes back, and then the ATP and ADP kind of go in a nice little cycle in our body to just kind of go around in a circle, charge, recharge, charge, recharge, that kind of thing. Right? So all of this starts with your first step, which is glycolysis. Right? So glycolysis is right here in green. So glycolysis is right there in green. Um, and for simple pictures, right, glucose is the sugar molecule in its simplest form. All complex sugars, starches, and carbs break down into itty-bitty pieces of glucose that are just strung together. Scientists can draw it quickly as like a little hexagon because that's kind of what it's shaped like with a bunch of hydrogens and oxygens attached to the outsides of it. That comes in, and that's important later, that comes in handy later. Um... All right, so that comes in handy later. Our bodies can break that simplest form of sugar down into something called a pyruvate. Depending on your book that you're using, it might also be called pyruvic acid. They are the same thing. Don't panic and freak out. So I say the word pyruvate because that's how I learned it. Just be aware. But glycolysis, if you see something that starts with glyco in it, normally that means it's referring to sugar, right? Lysis means to break. So glycolysis is the first step, and it is breaking your sugars in half. So what we do for glycolysis is we are literally breaking a sugar in half into two pyruvates. It's what your body does. There is a little chemical reaction that goes with this that you guys don't really need to know for this class. You may need to know it for microbiology. What you need to know is the end result of glycolysis is you have two pyruvates, so you have two halves of your glucose. Doing this process, glycolysis, costs two energies to do. It uses two ATPs, but in doing this, it makes four ATPs. So your net gain of energy just by doing glycolysis is two ATP was gained for your body. You need to know that glycolysis, this first step, happens in the cytoplasm of your cells, so in the jelly that's in the middle of your cells, and that it, it, that, and that it is anaerobic, right? Anaerobic means it does not use oxygen, no oxygen needed. This is super important. Glycolysis is super simple. Every single living organism, from single-celled yeast organisms to our bodies, can do glycolysis. You don't need oxygen for it. It gives you itty-bitty, little-bitty amounts of energy, but everything can do it. We use the powers of glycolysis... Um, to make things like cheese and yogurt because we put specific bacteria into milk and let the bacteria ruin the milk so that it's not milk anymore. But in that bacteria's process of doing glycolysis, it turns it into yogurt or cheese. We do the same thing with yeast, except yeast's byproduct, instead of being the lactic acid that will build up in our muscles when our body does this too much, yeast, instead of making lactic acid makes ethanol or alcohol. So we like to make yeast very happy, mix it with some good carbs and some good sugars, especially with wine or especially with grape juice, leave it sitting there for a very long time in, say, an oak cask, and then open it up in a couple years and we have wine. Or we do that in a giant vat and make beer with wheat. It just depends upon what sugars you put into it and what other things are in that sugary substance or mesh. Um, that Determine whether you get whiskey, beer, wine, 
hard cider, that kind of thing when you're doing fermentation and when it's yeast undergoing glycolysis. But that's the basic of that step. And that's the most basic step our body does with this. Right? But our bodies are way more complex than an itty-bitty single-celled yeast. We need more than just 2 ATP. So our bodies take the game up a notch. And this is when we get into all of those little bitty hydrogens that are hanging off the edges of each of those corners. Right? So each pyruvate is going to come on, mosey over here, to your citric acid to your citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. This is inside the mitochondria, inside the matrix. And if you look this up online or in your textbook, you're going to see a terrifying formula that starts with two lines at the top and then you have a giant circle of chemicals going all the way around. You don't need to know that formula for me. You may need to know that full formula when you get into microbiology. I don't know. That will depend upon your microbiology teacher. What you need to know is that hydrogen likes to party it up and all of the carbons and hydrogens are going to a frat party from that pyruvate. They're gonna go down frat row here, meet up with a buddy called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA needs oxygen to work. We'll get into that in a second. But what they're gonna do is they're gonna party it up and go all the way around frat row, right? And as each hydrogen gets too drunk to function, they're gonna fall away from the group. Eventually, the carbons are going to hook up with oxygens, and they're going to fall away from the group. In total, what happens during the Krebs cycle is you're going to end up with three carbon dioxides breaking off from that pyruvate molecule, and a ton of these little hydrogens that are drunk and staggering around trying to get home. Right? This com complicated cycle is where we get our waste that we breathe out, the carbon dioxide, but it also makes two ATP, two lowly energies. What's more important here are all of these ox or hydrogens that are staggering away from front row and the party and they need to get back to their apartment complexes and home, right? Enter in Uber and Lyft, NAD and FAD. These are two chemical compounds that act like taxis. That's all they do, one is Uber, one is Lyft. And NAD, your Uber, will only pick up one hydrogen at a time because it's kind of sketchy, right? Lyft, on the other hand, your FAD, will pick up two hydrogens at a time so they can use the buddy system. Use Lyft, right? Especially after the creepiness that happened in Atlanta last year. Be careful, guys, and travel with friends. Um, but these two things are the more important part of the Krebs cycle. Each pyruvate that goes through this massive party and Krebs cycle is going to end up producing three NADHs and one FADH2. That means that in total, one glucose molecule is going to make six NADHs and two FADH2s, right? That's important. So that means you are filling up a bunch of taxis to carry these hydrogens away, and they are what's important here. And all of this needs oxygen to happen because acetyl-CoA needs oxygen to get everybody through frat row. So this needs oxygen. This is why we breathe. This whole cycle does not happen if you don't have oxygen here to help it out get onto frat row. So when we are breathing in and out and our bodies are collecting oxygen, this is what we collect oxygen for. If you are working out super, super hard and you are out of breath, and you your body doesn't have enough oxygen in it, this is the process that your body amps up because it doesn't need oxygen, right here with the glycolysis, to try and make up for the fact that your body can't keep up and keep doing the Krebs cycle. But glycolysis in our bodies break down into lactic acid. You get a little bit of energy to keep you going, but you're also building up lactic acid, which burns and is bad for you. So eventually you can kind of like, your muscles will be super sore because you have acid burned your own muscles and whatnot. This is why after you've pushed yourself too hard during a workout, it's one of the reasons why your muscles ache. Remember from a and P1, when you've also worked out too hard, you've kind of torn your muscle fibers a little bit so they can heal bigger, which is what makes your muscles grow. This is the other reason why. 
Um, but if you have the oxygen, you go through Krebs cycle, you get all these nice taxis filled up, you have to have oxygen to do this. Right? This is aerobic. You need oxygen. But all of these taxis are then sent to the Christae in your mitochondria to go through the electron transport chain. So what's going to happen here is these nice NADHs and FADH2s are going to drop off the hydrogens. And then these NADHs and FADHs are just going to go back to the Krebs cycle because they're a taxi service. They go round and round and round all the time. That's all they do. Pick up hydrogens, drop them off here, go back, pick up more hydrogens, drop them off here. It's their job, right? They're taxi drivers. These hydrogens, though, they've been on front row, they've partied it up, they are drunk, they just want to go home. So they're along your cell membranes and the cristae of your mitochondria, and these little hydrogens here are going to bounce around the proteins, right? And they're going to bounce from protein to protein to protein until they find the one that has the revolving door that they can get through because that's their apartment complex. They are going to get to that revolving door, spin it around and push it open, go through, travel through that protein, and then be freed into their apartment complex on the other side. There you go. They're good. But they're also kind of drunk. They're not, they're inconsiderate, and they're not watching what they're doing. So as they are spinning around this windmill-like protein here, right, to spin around, this lowly little phosphorus that was just sitting next to the door, or the revolving door, ends up getting knocked into his friends of ADP. That charges the ADP, because now there's three phosphoruses, and it makes ATP, which is your energy. So you have a ton of hydrogens that are just going through this system. In total, your body, per glucose that you eat, so per itty-bitty little sugar molecule that you have, We'll make 34 ATP in total just from your hydrogens being drunk and inconsiderate and pushing and causing this nice little chemical process right here that's in pink called oxidative phosphorylation. But that means that this process right here for the electron transport chain made 34 ATP or energies. In total, if we're counting things up, that means if your body is being as efficient as it possibly can, you make two ATP from glycolysis, you get two from the Krebs cycle, you get 34 from your electron transport chain, and your body in total, when all is said and done, from one sugar molecule will make 38 ATPs, or 38 energies. Right? 38 energies... This is what your totals are that you need to know. Right? And that's how your body makes energy for everything you do. Um, I will scan this big picture in so you have just this big picture that's color-coded. Um, that's pretty much what you need to know about cellular respiration. This is kind of simplified down because, like I've said before, chemistry was not a prerequisite for anatomy and physiology. You probably will need to know this a little bit more in depth for your microbiology class, but that's for when you get to microbiology. That's all you need to know for me in A and P2. Right? Uh, have a good night, guys.